This week, uh, in the tradition of uh, the Christian faith, some refer to it as Holy Week, and others as Passion Week. Both would be appropriate uh, to describe what began the week and what was to conclude the week. Although it is um, a blessing to celebrate the birth of Jesus, ultimately, as Christians, we look to this particular week and the events of this week to help anchor and to solidify our faith in the Almighty God. It's in this week that we discover the deep passion and desire of the Lord for his creation. Because after all, he gave his only begotten son that you and I may have the right to eternal life. If we were to try to walk this week through, we would say that Sunday was his triumphant entry into Jerusalem. During what would be Passover. Um, I'm just building up to something, so let me bore you for a little bit longer, then we'll jump into the text. As Jesus entered into Jerusalem, the Bible says that there was a crowd waiting for him, waving palms and cheering him on, shouting, Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. They praised him. They celebrated him. They um, looked forward to his coming because after all, his reputation preceded him. He was one that was known for performing miracles. He, he was able to do what many would consider to be the impossible. After all, what manner of man was he that he was able to calm the winds and the seas, and they obeyed. He was a man who, when he entered into a graveyard, he delivered a man from legions. He was one who was able to take blinded eyes, and they, be, they regained sight. A woman who had an issue of blood, all she did was touch the hem of his garment, and she was made whole. So his reputation preceded him, and so they celebrated his coming during Passover. The Passover event was one that took place as Israel was making ready to depart from Egypt after 427 years of enslavement. It was on the eve of their departure that they were instructed by the angel of the Lord to take a sacrificial lamb and to spread the blood of that lamb over the doorpost in order that the death angel may pass over. Howbeit, we find that in this approach of Jesus to Jerusalem during Passover, we yet find ourselves with another sacrificial lamb being offered to God. Throughout the week, Jesus continued to perform miracles and make ready to enjoy Passover with his disciples until that evening when Jesus met with his disciples for what would be considered the Last Supper. It was in this gathering, Jesus revealed that his death was coming. And that there was one with him that would betray him. They all began to ask, Lord, is it I? Is it I? Nonetheless, that meal ended. Jesus took his disciples to the Garden of Gethsemane where he began to pray. And as he was praying, he prayed the prayer, Father, if it's your will, let this cup pass for me. 
He agonized. He agonized so deeply in prayer that the Bible says that droplets of blood fell from his pores. He was so stressed by the next event, the next moment, that he began to sweat blood. He was arrested, and truly it was one of his disciples that betrayed him. He was then brought before the governor, and it was there that the same crowd that praised him coming into Jerusalem was the same group of people that cried out, crucify him, crucify him, crucify him. Jesus gets to the cross, and again, there are seven sayings that Jesus spoke that are significant to us as Christians, that helps to solidify our faith. But tonight we want to focus on, I thirst. Jesus is now on the cross, and he's at a pivotal point. Because in this moment, he's already experienced what it's like to be in hell. He's already had the experience of God turning his back on him when he bore all the sin of the world. When he cried out, Eli, Eli, lama sabbatani, which is my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? In this moment, Jesus understood what it was like to be away from the Father for what would be almost an eternity. He knows what it's like to experience the absence of God's presence because he was in hell when he was on the cross. It's there that when that moment passed and life was coming to its finale, a gesture took place that, believe it or not, we practice today. And we don't even realize it. How often have we been with someone who was on the final stages of life and they could no longer drink? And so they now have sponges that we dip in water to put on their lips just to try to give them some type of drink. In this gesture, they heard Jesus say, I thirst. And immediately they perceived that he needed something or he wanted or desired something to drink. But the reality is the phrase, I thirst, had absolutely nothing to do with Jesus being parched. Quite frankly, it was a statement that Jesus made that was far deeper than what the body could ever understand. It was a spiritual need, and yet also one that could only be fulfilled by the Spirit of the living God. When Jesus uttered the phrase, I thirst, that word thirst, was he was referring to a deep longing for something greater than what could, this world could ever satisfy. There was two things in particular for which Jesus was longing for. The first, he was longing for the presence of God once again. This is something that we experience uh, as children who have strayed from the will of God, we, who have found ourselves in sin and, 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 and the need to be going after what would be that eternal relationship with God. When we were with God in the garden, we see there that Adam walked with God daily. There was something there that drew Adam to the presence of the Lord every day. And when sin occurred, it caused there to be that bridge, that separation between us and God. Since then, we've been wanting to gain the presence of the Lord. We too, as according to the book of Psalms in the first chapter, like a deer patcheth for water, so does my soul longeth for thee, O God. Jesus, he desired to be in the presence of the Father yet once again. That longing sensation that can only be fulfilled by God the Father 
himself. But he also longed for something else. I thirst again had nothing to do with his need for drink. But it had everything to do with his desire to see the fulfillment of scripture and for the saints of God to come home. He longed for you and I. He longed to, for the day that you and I would come unto the saving knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. That we would recognize the gift of God's love and that gesture on the cross. The ultimate price that was paid for your sin and mine. The one that neither of us nor in the collective would have the ability to die for ourselves, let alone for someone else. But Jesus, he longed for the souls that God entrusted to him. He longed for the completion of the salvation plan so that God's creation would be redeemed. I thirst. When they placed sour wine on a sponge and put it on hyssop to give to him, the hopes, the hope was that he would drink it because the sour wine was known to numb, to give you a numbing sensation, to hopefully ease some of the pain while he was on the cross. We don't give sour wine today in the hospital, but we do give morphine, an element to help ease the pain as one prepares to transition from this life into the next. Jesus did not desire that, nor did he accept it. The issue was not the need to numb the pain, but he accepted the will of God that he must die for you and I. It goes without saying that he had the power and the ability to call forth a legion of angels to release him, to bring him down from that cross and to rectify the issue with his enemies. But Jesus said, I thirst because he thought of you. He thought of me. What would happen if he would have got down off that cross? How would we have then been able to make it into the kingdom? How would our relationship be restored with God? After all, he was the sacrificial lamb. You see, in the Passover, they spread the blood of the lamb over the doorpost that the death angel would pass by their house. Well, over it would not stop by. Jesus, he became that for us. You see, he died and he let his blood be shed so that you and I would have access to eternal life. Because without the shed blood of Jesus, there would be no eternity. Without the shed blood of Jesus, there would not be a restoration of our relationship with, with the Father. Without the Lamb of God, who bore the sins of the world, we would be condemned to hell for all eternity. Thanks be unto God that Jesus, he chose to stay on that cross. Thank you, Lord, that you chose to long and to thirst for our salvation. Thank you, Father, that you were willing to give your only begotten son that we would have the right to eternal life. Thank you, Jesus is the appropriate response to the statement, I thirst. Even now he thirsts, he longs for the salvation of the world. As chaotic as it may be, as crazy as things may appear, Jesus is still in the saving business. Souls can still be redeemed. Lives can still be changed. Minds can be changed if we would only surrender to Christ. It was in this moment 
that they didn't quite understand what Jesus really was saying. On this Good Friday, and I remember growing up and um, listening to the many sermons of, on Good Fridays, I remember asking God the question, what was so good about today? From what I see, this was a horrible day. I mean, if we look at it with our perspective, this was, this was not good at all. What's good about it? An innocent man died for you and I. A crowd of people lied on him and became a false witness. The, the ones who had the power to rectify it chose to ignore it. So what was good about it? And then it, it was as I grew older, I began to understand why it was good and why we call it Good Friday. Because had it not been for the Lord, we would be condemned. Even in all the lies that were told on him, he longed for their salvation. The false witnesses that came to accuse him, he even prayed for their forgiveness. The one who had the authority to stop this shenanigans, even he, Christ died for. See, that's the power of love at its best. For God's love was so great and so strong that Jesus continued to do what was necessary in order that you and I would be redeemed. If he's willing, if he was willing to do all of that for us, what are we willing to do for him? I'm going to close with this. I mentioned in the book of Psalms in the first chapter, it says, as a deer panteth for water, so does my soul longeth for thee, O God. Do we long for the Lord tonight? How is our walk in our relationship with the Lord? Because after all, he paid the ultimate price that we may live again. And all he requires of us is to present ourselves as a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto him, which is our reasonable service. This is our reasonable form of worship. So tonight we do celebrate and we do call it Good Friday. Because had he not gone to that cross and died for our sins, we would not have this relationship with God that we do today. And I don't know about you, but each day it gets sweeter and sweeter as the days go by. God bless you.